Good morning. Can everybody hear me? It's May 31st, 2024, and I'm brushing my teeth, getting ready for bed, and wondering what tomorrow will hold. I'm not just attending, but I'm also participating in my first pride parade. And suddenly, I'm thinking about recent history in Tower District involving the Proud Boys. I shudder. I wonder if I'm doing the right thing as a parent planning to bring my six-year-old deeply sensitive child to the parade. Will there be protesters? Will it be scary for James? How do I prepare him for what he may observe during the festivities? He's already in bed, so it's too late to talk to him about protesters, and I'm not entirely ready to address how any Proud Boys, despite the confusing name, are not a fun part of Pride. And then it hits me. You see, I've also been thinking a lot about Jonah in anticipation of this homily. I don't want to identify with Jonah. I'm an admitted Swifty. Taylor Swift could have written her Midnight's album hit anti-hero about Jonah. In the song, she sings about growing older but never wiser. Later, she sings about staring directly at the sun but never in a mirror. Jonah grows older but never wiser. Jonah stares directly at the sun but never in a mirror. So as much as I enjoy Taylor Swift and that song in particular, I don't want to identify with the Jonah aspect of it. But suddenly, as I'm brushing my teeth, I realize who some of my Ninevites are. And I'm struck by all the admittedly wiggly parallels between Jonah's life and mine. Before we get there though, Let's do a quick recap of the whole story of Jonah. It's only four chapters, none of them are very long, and we only heard the final chapter this morning. It all starts with God calling Jonah to go to Nineveh and preach God's message of repentance. Jonah is not happy, and he gets on a boat going as far away as he can from Nineveh. While on the boat, a massive storm comes. He realizes the storm is his fault. And after some persuading, he convinces his fellow travelers to throw him overboard to calm the raging sea. A large fish, some people call it a whale, comes along and swallows Jonah up. Instead of getting digested, Jonah is able to pray, and his prayer suggests that he expects God is going to rescue him from these dire circumstances. He expects mercy. He expects grace. Three days later, the fish vomits Jonah up, and Jonah reluctantly heads to Nineveh, to give them God's message. Despite an understanding that the Ninevites are brutal, bloodthirsty people, they respond pretty effortlessly to God's message. They declare a fast, and they decide to change their behavior. Then we get to the last chapter, where I start to get nervous about what God wants us to learn from this wild story. Before I get to the big parallel, the one that scares me, I feel I would be remiss if I neglected to highlight some of the other interesting parallels in this story, especially as I was thinking about protesters and Jonah. The easiest route is to obviously call those folks, those other people, the Jonas, certainly not me. First, let's think about the types of signs we often see at these protests. 
especially the protesters who claim to have the same faith that I do. Repent. The end is near. 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Okay, so that last one isn't really one that we see regularly now. But isn't it interesting that this is allegedly the totality of the sermon that Jonah gave to the Ninevites? We could see it as weak, lackluster, pitiful. I mean, this is the man who, in an effort to avoid the Ninevites, decided to directly disobey God, hopped on a boat, heading in the opposite, of, opposite direction of Nineveh to Tarshish, got caught in a storm, advised perfect strangers to throw him overboard, was swallowed by a massive fish, spent three days somehow avoiding being digested by that fish, all to be vomited up so he could, against all odds, proclaim to the Ninevites, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overturned. And rather shockingly, this message actually worked. The king got word of Jonah's warning and got everyone to urgently call on God and change their evil ways. So, God relented, and Nineveh was saved from destruction. Of course, like any person who has massively succeeded in a persuasive speech, Jonah was thrilled, right? Wrong. He was absolutely livid. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, though. I told you we would talk about some parallels, and then I just told you one except I was being a bit misleading about those parallels only dealing with Jonah, protesters, and me. It's much more fun to think about how Jonah is parallel to Jesus. I could have done a whole sermon just talking about the importance of three days in Jonah's story. Surviving three days in the belly of a fish sounds an awful lot like Jesus rising from the grave after three days. Or there's this fun little nugget that goes back to the idea of Jonah doing the bare minimum. Jonah 3.3 3 tells us that, and it makes a point of telling us, that it takes three days to travel through Nineveh. But in verse 4, Jonah only traveled one day when he shared his message. Forty more days and Nineveh will be overturned. The Ninevites believe in God. A fast is declared. The king and even the animals get involved. Like I said earlier, you would think Jonah would be thrilled at the tremendous success of this message, but he's not. In fact, he is so upset, he asks God to kill him. In chapter 2, while he's in the belly of a fish, Jonah utters a beautifully poetic prayer clearly believing God will save him from these circumstances. But the Ninevites stunningly repent, and that does Jonah in. He offers another far less beautiful prayer. Lord, I knew you would do this, and that's why I tried to run away. I knew you would be gracious, compassionate, slow to anger, bounding in love, and relent from sending calamity. And since you did what I expected, just kill me. Remember, this is a man who from the belly of a fish cried out to God expecting grace and compassion for himself. But heaven forbid that grace extend to the Ninevites. God asks, is it right for you to be angry? Jonah responds by throwing himself an epic pity party. At least that's how I interpret what happens next in the text. Jonah goes somewhere where he can just sit up high and stare at the city, waiting for something to happen. He makes himself a little shelter, and God helps him by providing a plant for shade. 
the plant makes Jonah happy. But then God sends a worm to destroy the plant. The sun blazes down on Jonah. And again, he utters, it would be better to die. God asks Jonah again if he's upset, this time if he's upset about the plant, to which Jonah dramatically replies that he is angry. And for the third time, he says he wishes he was dead. And how does God respond? God kills Jonah. Oh, wait, no, no, that's not what happens. God explains to Jonah that Nineveh and the people in it matter to God. God cares for the Ninevites. And then the story ends, this time for real. We're not given any closure about whether Jonah understands and experiences his own heart transformation. It's just over. So this is where thinking about the point of Jonah gets interesting for me. And I will say, this, this sermon series that we've been doing together about phases of our faith, Jonah's not like Shipper and Pua. He's not a hero here. <laughs> I like to think about things like context, and part of that is knowing what genre the writer is using to get the story across. I don't know if I ever believed a real man named Jonah survived being swallowed by a large fish, all to be spit back up so he could spread God's love to the Ninevites. It's a pretty fantastic tale. But guess what? This isn't the only time that Jonah son of Amittai, is mentioned in the Old Testament. You see, he's also mentioned in 2 Kings 14.25, where King Jeroboam II is discussed. Jeroboam restored the boundaries of Israel from Lebo Hamath to the Dead Sea. Why did he do this? Well, because of the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, spoken through his servant, the prophet from Gath Heifer. I'll give you one guess what that prophet's name was. It rhymes with Kona of Amittai. Great job if you guessed Jonah. 10 points for Gryffindor. So this all begs the question, what kind of story is this? Is it a historical narrative? Is it a fairy tale, biography, or fable? I'll be honest, I don't have the answer to this question. Perhaps the more important question is, why is this story in the scripture? The hero is anything but heroic. Why bring us all on this journey involving a miraculous fish for Jonah to behave impishly throughout the story? Maybe it has something to do with why God selected Jonah for this task in particular. Remember, Jonah's other claim to fame was to get King Jeroboam II to restore the boundaries in Israel. As some further history, King Jeroboam II is an evil king who God used to save Israel. This isn't exactly the stuff of legends. God calls the man who helped an evil king in Israel to restore the boundaries, and God calls that man to leave the safety of those boundaries and go somewhere vile, Nineveh. Now, we don't really get an impression about how Jonah felt working with an evil king in Israel to restore boundaries. But I do think it's interesting that the same man tasked with working with an evil king to help save Israel is later repulsed by the idea of how he helped the king in evil Nineveh help save Nineveh. It almost seems like Jonah is really upset because he had to help the outsiders, not about their being evil. Perhaps Jonah was reeling a bit from this particular task. 
Perhaps it bothered him that his other significant message was to restore boundaries in Israel and knowing God would show mercy to the Ninevites if Jonah would just go and tell them about their impending doom. This message would somehow undo his work saving Israel. So what does it mean to have a story in scripture about a disobedient prophet who did the bare minimum in Nineveh succeed wildly in persuading the Ninevites to change their ways, all to be so upset about the success of his mission, he tells God three times he wishes he was dead. I sincerely doubt we're meant to think Jonah a hero in this story. I think at least partially we're meant to be stunned by God's choice to send Jonah, a man who clearly didn't get the point. God welcomes all, even the Ninevites, even the outsiders. This brings me back to the part where I said I don't want to feel myself too parallel to Jonah. But if I'm being honest, I do. It doesn't take a rocket scientist, a brain surgeon, or Sigmund Freud to realize that humanity is deeply divided of late. To a certain extent, I know that this has always been the case, but I personally feel it more now. Even just this week, there have been constant reminders that our country is divided. I will be the first to admit, I'm a lawyer, and one of the first things I will be doing tomorrow morning is checking the Supreme Court docket to see what they have to say about presidential immunity. There's really no denying that division has also reached the church. This church has felt the sting of what it means to disagree. I personally struggle with how to be gracious in my heart when I disagree with someone. In this, I'm not at all suggesting that we're always meant to agree or that we should shy away from calling out hate when we see it. But I can't help but wonder what part of me others and does not have space in my heart to see the Ninevites in my world experience true transformation. What is the correct response when someone has done evil, vile things and truly repents? Certainly it is not sitting back, watching the potential fallout and wishing you were dead because God found a way to turn things around. When God miraculously brings the outsiders in, what can we learn from the story of Jonah? I think Jesus showed us best with the story of the prodigal son. When people turn around and cry out to God in repentance, we're not meant to sit on high hoping for their destruction. Which brings me how, to how I feel parallel to Jonah. I'll admit, lately I have a hard time navigating how to interact with people who think, feel, and believe differently than I do, especially on certain issues. I find myself othering more and more lately. Sometimes I even catch myself sitting somewhere up high and waiting and hoping for God to knock them down a peg or two. I don't like it. During seminary, one of the professors assigned the class to read A Wind in the Door by Madeline Langle. It made me think critically about how we label others. My favorite part discusses the evil powers in the story called the x that are trying to destroy Charles Wallace's mitochondria. And if they can succeed in destroying Charles Wallace's mitochondria, the x will succeed in destroying everything. The character, Progo, explains to another character, Meg, about the x saying, I think your mythology would call them fallen angels. War and hate are the, their business, and one of their chief weapons 
is unnaming, making people not know who they are. If someone knows who he is, really knows, then he doesn't need to hate. That's why we still need namers, because there are places throughout the universe, like your planet Earth, when everyone is really and truly named, then the Exroy will be vanquished. And do you know what Meg has to do with this information? She has to name her school principal, who she hates, who has been her enemy throughout the story. And she has to name him correctly. And that includes loving him. It's really too bad Jonah never got to read A Wind in the Door. Maybe he would have appreciated God's plan a little bit more. Having sat with Jonah myself under the blazing sun, I have realized that I am more like him than I care to be. And I suspect that is what we are meant to do at the end of the story. We are not meant to think Jonah a good prophet. We are meant to recognize how sad it is that the story at the end of the story, Jonah doesn't get it. God welcomes all, even the brutal, bloodthirsty Ninevites. So I leave you with this challenge. Who are the Ninevites in your life? Do you have space in your heart for your own Ninevites to shockingly repent and change their ways? I know that I really hope that I do. I would like to leave you with the words of another famous Jew, one I actually respect a little more than Jonah, the late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Yet what greater defeat could we suffer than to come to resemble the forces we oppose in their disrespect for human dignity? May we always have space to watch our Ninevites repent and be overjoyed when God does the miraculous and moves the Ninevites to change. <laughs>